Hello and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. In today's episode, we're talking about R naught, the reproductive number. What is it? Um, what are some values of R naught for different diseases? And what factors influence what those values actually are? Before we get into it really quick, I'm gonna ask for your support. Please go down there and click some of those buttons. Help support the Penguin Prof channel. I really appreciate your help. Okay, so the definition, this is an epidemiological term and R naught is the basic reproduction number or ratio. It is not a rate, okay? And here is the full definition if you wanna see that. Okay, we're, we're gonna penguin prof this, all right? That's, that's a little cumbersome. So R naught represents the average number of new infections generated by each infected person. So high values mean that it's easy to transmit and low values obviously means it's difficult to transmit. Now there's a big assumption here. It assumes no pre-existing immunity, so everyone is susceptible. So that means no one has been exposed to the disease before, meaning it's new in humans, and no one has been vaccinated against it. Okay, so those are really important assumptions here. There are three options for the values of R0. It can be less than one, which means the number of new cases will decrease over time. That is fantastic. It can be equal to one, which means the case number is stable over time, or it can be greater than one, which means that the outbreak is self-sustaining unless control measures are implemented. We're gonna look at all three cases in a variety of ways. Here's what it looks like when R0 equals one. What does that mean? It means that one person infects another person. Now, these individuals will either recover, hopefully, or die in a worst case scenario, but each person infects only one other person. So hopefully what you're seeing here is that the number of cases remains stable over time. If R0 is less than one, so let's say it's 0.25. Okay, now obviously humans aren't infecting a quarter of another human, right? This is an average over a population, but hopefully you get where I'm going with this. Over time, the number of cases will decrease and will eventually basically die out. That's a good thing. When R0 is greater than one, let's say R0 equals two. So when each person infects two people and those two people infect two people and so on and so on, you can see how the number of cases will increase over time. And it only gets worse the bigger that R0 value gets. So here's R0 equals three and um, things started to get a little messy here. Same number of cycles. Now I've got 81 people infected. If you look at something like an R0 of 18, I couldn't do all the generations here, obviously. These numbers get very big, very fast. Let's put this in context and look at some different R0 values for different diseases. And by the way, I got these data for R0 from the CDC website. They have great historical data. These are averages. Hepatitis C and Ebola, I'm talking about the 2014 Ebola epidemic, R naughts reported around two, SARS and HIV around four, smallpox and rubella seven, chickenpox and mumps 10, measles as high as 18. Remember this guy? Yeah, measles. Please notice I'm expanding the lower end of this line so we can look at some more diseases down here. MERS, 0.75. And maybe now you can see how that disease kind of fizzled out over time, right? The R0 is less than one. H1N1, that's the 2009 influenza pandemic that I'm talking about, R0 of about 1.5. The 1918 influenza pandemic, 2.2. By the way, that was also an H1N1 virus with genes of avian origin. That pandemic lasted from January of 1918 until December of 1920, and an estimated 500 million people became infected. That's about a third of the world population. The number of deaths estimated at about 50 million, although people think that that number is drastically underreported. Seasonal influenza ranges between 0.9 and 2.1, and COVID-19 is coming in right now at between two and three. That number is expected to drop as we get more data and more people globally are tested. 
Now the value of R0 depends on three factors. The first one is the duration of infectiousness. How long can an infected person give the disease to other people? That's not as simple as it sounds because it varies, it seems, genetically with individuals and it depends on the state of infection that the person is experiencing. We know that at different stages of infection, people shed different amounts of viral particles. Factor number two, the probability of transmission between an infected and a susceptible person. Now that depends on the type of contact and the method of transmission of the pathogen. So R0 is gonna be higher when you're looking at diseases with droplet or aerosol transmission, and it's gonna be lower when transmission requires an exchange of bodily fluids. The third factor has to do with the average rate of contact between infected and susceptible individuals. This is really variable and it depends on what kind of lifestyle, what kind of living situation, work environment, and social activities, etc., that an individual has. So here we go. The first two factors are affected by the characteristics of the pathogen and the host, meaning that's determined by biology. This third one, this is affected by behavior, and that's where things like social distancing play their role. I'm going to recommend you guys check out this incredible simulation online, the link is below, by Harry Stevens, who's a graphics reporter at the Washington Post. He gave me permission to show the simulation in this video, but the Washington Post demanded $1,000, so I couldn't afford that. So unfortunately, uh, you're going to have to look at this little image here. What you do when you go to this site is you can run these simulations and you can see the effect of different types of distancing on the number of cases and how they change over time. So we've got sick, healthy, and recovered individuals in a free-for-all, attempted quarantine, moderate distancing, and extensive distancing. Now, every time you run the simulation, your results will be slightly different. It is a really incredible simulation. Please go check it out. Obviously, this is what we're going for, right? Very, very low numbers of sick people, very, very high numbers of healthy people, and this gives the healthcare system time to treat those who do become sick, and it gives time to come up with therapeutic agents and hopefully a vaccine. Finally, some challenges here. Uh, we don't actually know the value of r naught until the outbreak is over, and that does frustrate us, but that's just the reality of how this works. R0 is also an average, and there are people that we call super spreaders. It's something called the 2080 rule. So 20% of infected people can be responsible for up to 80% of transmissions. Uh, one of the most famous examples of this was Typhoid Mary. She was an Irish cook, and she infected at least 51 people, three of whom died, but she herself was asymptomatic, and she's now known as a super spreader. Some other challenges, things like how we define a case. Um, those who test positive, what about suspected cases? Um, and different healthcare systems around the world treat these things differently, and that makes the calculation of r naught difficult. Time is also really important. There are delays in requesting and receiving tests, getting your results back, and getting the results from an individual back to health authorities. So usually what we see is at the beginning of an epidemic or a pandemic, those values of r naught are very high, and they start to fall as testing improves, and we start testing individuals who are not showing symptoms for the disease. It's a lot, I know. I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for visiting the Penguin Prof channel. Please show your support by clicking those buttons below. Like, share, subscribe, hit the bell. Join me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Wishing health, safety, and peace to everyone. Good luck.